very much, Henry, for the very kind introduction. And uh, I'm delighted to be here, uh, to be back in Washington. As Henry said, I worked in DC for several years before I went back to Princeton to do my PhD. It's really nice to be back and, and to see some familiar faces in the audience. Um, so this is an opportunity for me to share with you some of my ongoing work on, uh, on a book project. The book project focuses more broadly across comparative way on the post-communist region, and I'm gonna to try to focus today's presentation um, on Russia. So I'll try to, um, I try to tailor the talk in a way that will be interesting and accessible um, to, um, to both policy audiences and, and, and students and scholars in the audience, um, but please push me farther in the Q&A if I err too much in one direction or another. Okay, so in the political science scholarship, the middle class has long been characterized as an agent of democratization. So whether we're talking about modernization theory or skeptics of modernization theory, whether we're talking about the more contemporary redistributive theories of democratization, um, or we're talking about cultural values-based theories of democracy, right, the middle class has been seen uh, as a force pushing forward democratization. And that's particularly the case as these mobilized democratic transitions have increasingly become the norm, right, with large-scale um, civic protests bringing about uh, regime change. And yet, empirically, as we look across time and space, there's been a lot of variation in the role of the middle class and its, um, its, uh, its role in democratization. Right? But as Ansel and Samuels know in their recent book, um, we have very few studies of the concrete preferences and interests of the middle class to guide us in understanding that variation. Okay, so this is where um, the current project tries to make a contribution. Okay, so you're looking at here is Russia's strategy 2020. This was the Kremlin set of ambitious development goals put forward back in like 2008, 2009. So this is from a presentation in Moscow in 2008. What's circled here is the goal of increasing the size of the middle class to more than 50% of the population by 2020. That goal ranks just behind increasing national GDP and uh, the rate of uh, per capita GDP growth. Okay? It ranks above important development goals like increasing export volumes right, and increasing the innovation sectors in society. Okay, so that's really very telling. And even though the Kremlin isn't talking much today about the strategy 2020, um, and since 2011, 2012 protest cycle, right, the Kremlin's sort of public discourse on the middle class has dampened down somewhat. Right? I would suggest that the goal of increasing the size of Russia's middle class and uh, of, of securing its loyalty remains an important strategic priority for the Kremlin. Okay, so in increasing the size of the middle class, is a regime like Russia's sort of sowing the seeds of its own demise? Right? I suggest no, and argue that across the post-communist region, right, and in Russia in particular, um, that uh, regimes strategically cultivate uh, a loyal segment of the middle class, right? that this middle class formation in these contexts right, is strongly shaped by state economic engagement. It's strongly shaped by the role that government plays in supplying upward mobility um, and providing uh, a social lift into the middle class. Right, and this means that the character of the state-supported middle class really differs in this context from what classical theories would lead us to expect. Okay? So this middle class is less democratic. It's more a force for uh, authoritarian stability. Um, and that because its status as middle class, right, the occupations that give it middle class status, um, that provide a, a social mobility and lift, as well as the benefits that it receives um, and, uh, and opportunities to earn um, informal rents on the basis of official position, um, depend um, strongly on the political control of the state. So in this project, I show that state dependence um, attenuates middle class support for democracy. I, um, I try to answer a set of questions that are really important for sort of understanding what causes what, which is to show that, um, that state dependence has this causal effect um, on political preferences, that it's not just that certain kinds of people select into um, government employment or move up into government um, employment, and that those people are from the 
get go less democratic. I, and also um, that it uh, that the state dependence of the middle class weakens and undermines um, pro-democracy protest coalitions. So let me begin to to um, to situate us in this case. I think you will recognize this picture of Russia's post-election protest in 2011, um, 2012. So following parliamentary elections um, and um, accusations of fraud. So this is from February um, 2012, this picture. I, so the primary narrative that emerged about these protests, as I'm sure you remember, was that these were pro-democracy protests of the urban middle class. Now, that was sort of the story that developed in the journalistic account. It was echoed in many cases by scholars. but. I would argue that that approach to these protests really distracts from some very crucial heterogeneity in the groups that participated. Right? And you can see that heterogeneity very clearly as you look at this picture. So in the front here, you've got um, these green and white flags and these orange flags. Those are some uh, of the democratic groups um, that were uh, present at these protests. But looking farther back, you've got the black, white, and yellow flags of the liberal democratic party, neither liberal nor democratic. <coughs> Behind them, you've got the red flags of the communists. All right, so groups across the ideological spectrum participated in these protests, not just those who were pushing for regime change and not just those um, who supported democracy. Now, it's also important to keep in mind which groups didn't participate, which groups were systematically less likely to take part in these demonstrations. Right? So who's not pictured here? Right? And um, as I'll show you in a few minutes, right, the state-supported middle class was systematically less likely to take part in these demonstrations. Right? And so paying more attention to those cleavages within the middle class, right, arguably helps us to explain what limited the potential size of this uh, pro-democracy protest coalition, helps to explain perhaps why these protests were not more successful at overturning the fraudulent election result, why they were not more successful um, at dislodging um, the incumbent regime. So the question here is really why and under what conditions um, would growth of Russia's middle class be likely um, to improve the country's prospects for democracy? So before I go any farther, I want to stop and say a word about um, what I mean by middle class, this much used, rarely defined term, term that is used and abused and defined in many different ways. Okay, so when I'm talking about middle class in this project, um, for me, middle class means, um, it signals the distinction between highly educated white collar workers and less educated routine and manual laborers. Okay, so I'm thinking about a sociological definition of the middle class that emphasizes education and occupation. Okay, education and occupation are clearly uh, correlated with, they're associated with income, but they're not the same thing. Right? There are gaps between those things that are Really important in, in the post-communist context. So there's plenty more to say there, um, but I want to set those questions aside, and if you'd like to return to them, I'd be happy to uh, in the Q&A. Okay, but this is a sociological definition of the middle class emphasizing education and occupation. Now, society obviously, in, um, in theory, also includes a group of elites, um, not only the middle class and those below them. Um, <coughs> For the empirical work here, right, most of this is, is going to be um, uh, on the basis of surveys, right, um, uh, nationally representative surveys. Um, the assumption in the empirical work is that we don't capture elites in those survey samples. And I think um, in the, the Russian context, the context of most developing states, the notion that you don't capture elites in those survey samples is a totally reasonable and defensible assumption. So why focus on education and occupation, right? Well, this is a long tradition um, in the sociological literature, a sort of standard neo-Weberian approach, um, but, uh, but there's also a theoretical reason, right? As a political scientist, right, I'm thinking about um, these very long-standing literatures, um, very long-standing notion um, that rising educational levels and increased occupational specialization produces more democratic attitudes and gives individuals the resources to participate more effectively in democratic politics. This is like one of the oldest and most influential micro-level ideas. 
um, in, uh, in, in comparative political behavior. And now this um, idea has a sort of corollary and a kind of macro-structural literature, um, which suggests that development leads to changes in the class structure of society, in particular growth of the middle class, um, which improves chances for democratization and democratic stability. And so this project is going to speak, um, just going to use evidence simply at this micro level. Right? This is where, where my contribution is with the kind of individual level survey data, individual attitudes and political behaviors. But when I get around to the conclusion, I'll try to draw out some implications for these macro level arguments. Right? And at both the micro and the macro level, right, the argument is that these theories, right, I'm in dialogue with these theories because these theories um, fail to account for the role of state economic engagement in development, fail to think um, uh, and incorporate systematically the effects of um, state dependence and um, state uh, institu economic institutions for shaping uh, individual preferences, the structure of the state and the labor market at the macro level. Okay, so this loyal middle class is a product of Russia's state-led development. Let me say a word about that. So, Modernization, right? Um, particularly late development or late modernization, um, tends to be accompanied by um, uh, growth in the state administration, by um, growth in uh, in uh, health and in human services. Um, that uh, that empowers um, a, a state-supported middle class. All right? The state tends to play a larger role uh, in late development, and this is in part because of the high capital requirements of late development, so the state sponsors state banks, which capitalize development, and then the state controls the commanding heights of the economy through um, uh, strategic sectors. And so Russia is an example of this, and obviously um, ideology also enters in and, and, and communist legacies, but both in the communist period and in the post-communist period, right, modernization, whether it's under Putin in the 2000s or in the communist period, um, uh, uh, expands the, the state bureaucracy right, through um, direct state intervention. Okay, so this creates um, the principal beneficiaries of these developments are um, the professionals um, who, who work in the, in the, the state uh, apparatus um, and in those state industries. Right? So this is the, the loyal middle class that I'm talking about. This group has interests which differ in fundamental ways from middle class groups which, uh, whose livelihoods are independent of the regime. Right? And these differences in interest right, create divisions within potential middle class coalitions, um, which I argue ultimately um, uh, weaken um, prospects for bottom up uh, democratization. Okay, so these are the type of, of individuals which typify, typify the sort of state middle class that I'm talking about. Right? They work, they're professionals in state banks. Right, they're teachers um, in, um, in, in universities, paid out of the state budget, and in the health sector, um, uh, paid out of the state budget. They uh, are in the state administration in various um, uh, ministries and in the state bureaucracy. Okay. Now this is, this is a diverse uh, group, but they share some uh, interests vis-a-vis -vis the status quo in common. Okay, so how important is public sector employment still in Russia today? So, well, not today. This data is from the middle of Putin's second term. This is from 2006. Okay, but this is public employment as a share of total employment, this total full-time employment. Okay, just under half. Public employment as a share of total middle-class employment is yet more significant, nearly 60%. Okay, so the public sector continues to play a really important role in securing the livelihoods of, uh, of, of Russia's middle class. We know from the work of some very good young Russian economists that there is a public-private sector wage gap in Russia. That um, individuals working in equivalent positions in the public and private in the public sector are paid less than uh, individuals working in the private sector. And yet, right, that's in terms of salaries. If we look at expenditure data, right, the state sector looks like it's doing better than the non-state sector. Right, so one way to interpret these data would be to suggest that. Um, there are opportunities to earn informal rents on the basis of one's official position. This, you might imagine very easily, is really true for people working in the state apparatus, soliciting large bribes. There are also large, everyday, informal markets uh, and corruption for um, you know, budget sector employees 
um, in, uh, in health and in education. And so that's what I think these, um, these uh, expenditure data are suggestive of. In the Russian context as well, we should keep in mind that um, income from entrepreneurial activities, right? if we imagine that the collapse that, um, that it was this entrepreneurial new middle class was gonna buttress these twin economic and political transformations, the share of income from entrepreneurial activities begins to shrink after 2001. It has continued to shrink to the present day. And of course, in the context of recession, it shrinks even faster. Right, the fastest growing segments of Russia's middle class over the same period, the 2000s to present, have been state officials, regional civil servants. They are um, uh, uh, individuals working in um, various parts of the security apparatus, in law enforcement, in intelligence, and in military. This is includes um, engineers, programmers, right, and other scientists working in the, the military industry, um, as well as public sector managers and professionals. Right. This is well documented. I have a variety of, uh, of of tremendous studies by Russian scholars um, and and Western scholars as well. <clears throat> So if this is a, the middle class group that's supporting the Putin regime, like this is important also for um, uh, thinking critically and, and revising our theories and comparative politics about sources of authoritarian resilience, right, which have overwhelmingly focused on either elites, that is like the group within the dictator's inner circle, um, or on poor voters, because poor voters are supposed to be easier to buy off, so easier to net more if you're thinking about votes you know, for lower cost. Um, I think this work suggests why it's also important that regimes um, spend more to co-opt the middle class. The work on co-optation and authoritarian regimes in political science is also focused overwhelmingly on the role of formal political institutions, particularly representative political institutions like parties, parliaments, legislatures, elections. Um, so this framework focuses on a different set of actors, the middle class, and um, different settings. Um, and brings back the importance of public sector uh, enterprises and organizations for uh, co-opting these key social groups that support um, regime stability. So democratization is fraught with uncertainty, right? but one thing is for sure, it entails political change in the political control of the state. Right? Um, I'm supposing that expectations about future welfare and future welfare relative to welfare in the present drive um, regime preferences and that those are shaped by state patronage in the present. And so when the status is middle class, the lift into the middle class, the benefits um, and even informal rents depend on political control of the state and the anticipated um, costs of supporting democratization are higher, okay, which makes me, um, means that state dependence it will moderate middle class demands for democracy. Right? And I expect that this is gonna affect both attitudes towards democracy and also the concrete actions that individuals take in uh, pursuing democracy. So things that we can all agree and are consequential things like protest All right, so I want to start by showing you the, um, the uh, in terms of empirical evidence, by uh, showing you what things look like across um, the post-communist um, non-democracies. Um, I'm going to do this using um, survey data, right? So I myself collect survey data across all of these countries. So I'm using European Bank for Reconstruction uh, and Development data across nine I'm gonna focus just on the 27 is the democracies and the non-democracy, I'm gonna focus just on the non-democracies. Okay, so I'm trying to explain first democratic attitudes. So I'm gonna use this classical item. Um, so very, very classic item, first one, with which of the following statements do you agree most? Democracy is preferable, or authoritarianism is sometimes preferable, or for people like me, it doesn't matter. And now we might worry that different people understand different things by the word democracy, and so I attempt um, um, to make this more concrete with the rest of these items. So there's seven more, which drill down about the importance of particular concrete democratic institutions. So this is everything from free and fair elections to a strong political opposition. Okay, so it turns out that, not uh, surprisingly, these things are all um, highly correlated. Right? They tend to go together. Um, support for one means support for the others. Um, and so I privilege um, uh, coherence um, and, and continuity across these items. And for simplicity, I'm gonna present um, the results um, for a single measure um, of, of democracy support. Um, uh, uh, but I've looked at this a bunch of different ways. So whether we just 
look at like an index of these items or just focus on something we think is really important like agreement that it's, in, that it's important to have a strong political opposition, I think the results are the same. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna plot for you now um, here on this axis the probability of, um, of being a democracy supporter. And so first I wanna show you what this is like if um, we just consider the um, difference between the middle class in these post-communist non-democracies and the non-middle class. Okay, so this is the way that this existing scholarship looks at these questions. We see that the middle class, yes, is indeed a little more supportive of democracy than the non-middle class, but um, it's not, this is not strong support for democracy and the differences aren't great. So I've suggested that it's really important to understand where that social lift comes from, where the status on, 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 on uh, what the status of middle class is reliant uh, by thinking about sector as well. And so when we do that, we see something very interesting um, in line with the theory, which is that you have the private sector middle class, which is significantly more supportive than democracy than everyone else. Um, about 70% more supportive than um, the working class. Whereas this state sector middle class is actually statistically indistinguishable in its support for its level of support for democracy from the working class. So we should be cautious about extrapolating from this kind of individual survey data, um, but if we were to extrapolate from this data, what this would suggest um, is that Growth of the middle class through the public sector won't contribute anything to bottom-up support for democratization. Okay, so that's at the cross-national level. I'm gonna skip through this because I'm gonna be short on time. I'm concerned as a social scientist about a lot, that these ro results are robust to a lot of different things and that we can think about these things a lot that it's not based on you know, my choice of uh, exactly how I've defined the middle class or exactly how I've defined democracy. Um, maybe we do better to think about these things in terms of like subjective identification with the middle class um, or uh, use household expenditures and stuff. So I do a bunch of those different things. The results are remarkably consistent across those different tests. Right, as a scholar of the post-communist region, I'm also concerned about some other kind of substantively different stories. So is it that state employees just blame democracy for the economic dislocation of the early 1990s? It right, turns out that's not the case. The story isn't that simple. They actually tend, to, um, those who see more economic dislocation over the post-communist period tend to blame the incumbent regime more in line with like an economic voting story. Um, than with this sort of story that sometimes we tell as scholars of post communist politics. Um, communist socialization, yeah, state employees got more communist socialization, that's part of it, but that's not the only thing going on. Post-communist state employment has an independent effect on, um, on regime preferences. And then I do a bunch of stuff that's particularly important from the perspective of um, identifying you know, kind of causal effects, identifying threats to inference. Okay, so it's not just said that like Democrats are more likely to go into the private sector or that Democrats, if they do, do decide to go into the state sector, don't last as long, they get weeded out. Um, and it's not just that um, the state employees in these surveys are afraid to tell survey researchers um, what they think. Um, it's not about fear of, of retribution. And I'd be happy to tell you more about how I come to those conclusions, the data underlying it in the Q&A. Okay, so now I wanna move on to political behavior and show you some um, evidence to come back to the example from the beginning of the talk of uh, the 2011-2012 protest cycle. And I do this using um, a terrific set of protest surveys that were done by the Levada Center. Um, so um, this is from late 2011 until early uh, 2013. This you're looking at here is a map of the geography of one of the protests. So if you're not familiar with these surveys, they did some really cool things, um, um, some very innovative approaches to trying to get a more um, representative and random sample of protest participants. I mean, they did that by sort of exploiting um, the, 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 the way that the protests were, were prearranged and the way that um, protesters had to pass um, uh, through particular checkpoints onto the square. So that's sort of cool, and I'd be happy to talk more about that as well. Um, we can't make uh, judgments about the things that impact protest participation 
from a sample of, by just asking protesters. We have to ask non-protesters the same question, right? And look at the differences between those two groups. Okay. So um, I use a, a second set of surveys. Um, uh, this was done by the Foundation for Public Opinion. It's a very large geo-rating surveys. Um, these surveys are, are especially useful in this context because they have regionally representative samples of both Moscow and Moscow Oblast. So Moscow and Moscow Oblast are the places from which most of the protesters captured in um, these surveys um, and who took part in those demonstrations, for the, the regions from which they were recruited. Okay, so they're the, the appropriate baseline. So let me just show you I, um, who mobilized in these demonstrations, just very simply, descriptively. This is the share of each group among the population on the x-axis and the share of each group among the protesters on the y-axis. Okay, so this red horizontal 45, de or 45 degree red line um, indicates um, proportional representation. Okay, so groups above the red line are dramatically overrepresented among the protesters. And that's what we see for the private sector middle class. Yeah, they're they were very highly mobilized. They're dramatically <coughs> overrepresented among protesters. By contrast, look at the state middle class. Right, it sits right on this 45 degree red line, um, meaning that Members of the state middle class were about as likely to participate in these protests as had they been drawn at random off the streets of Moscow. But this is just a descriptive, um, it's, we're just relating two variables and you know, if you have you know, public sector in Russia, it's uh, a little more female, it tends to be older, there could be other things going on. So maybe it's about those other characteristics and it's not about state employment that's keeping people off the streets per se. Okay, so to understand that question, we need to do a different kind of analysis and this is where um, I'm uh, using an a, a approach um, for the a methodological approach for the first time in this literature that um, is a, a principled way of combining that population data that I told you about with the protest <coughs> data. Um, so I'm able to control for other characteristics like gender, age, um, and ideology. So those are the results I'm gonna show you next. Okay, so um, lots of fancy terms here, but like the, the way to interpret this um, is um, that uh, we're gonna compare the, uh, the probability of, uh, of protest participation for the first group, right, state workers versus the second, okay, private sector workers. Okay, um, so uh, a risk ratio of one would mean that the two groups are equally likely to protest. A risk ratio of less than one mean that the first group is less likely to protest than the second. Okay? So here we see that um, a state sector worker um, was about 40% less likely to protest, right? all else equal, to a similarly situated um, worker in the private sector. By the same token, a right, member of the state sector middle class was about 25% less likely to protest than a similarly situated individual um, in the private sector middle class. So in this case, right, clearly state employment does seem to have an independent effect um, or depress protest turnout. Okay. Um, so you can see right, the state middle class is still more likely to protest than um, the state working class. Which is, which is worth noting, but it's also important to ask why they protested. What were they doing on the street, given right, the heterogeneity um, and opinion and aims and goals that I talked to you about at the beginning. This, yeah. this is gonna take too long to describe, but let me give you the, um, the upshot, right, is that state sector Democrats, we know that the group of, of, of state middle class that supports democracy is small to begin with, right? What this, data suggests is that, um, that even that small group of state sector Democrats was demobilized, you know, that they were even less likely, that the state effectively, it suggests that the state effectively used selective incentives to keep them off the streets, right? promises of, of being fired if they showed up or inducements um, to show up to pro-regime rallies instead. Okay, so let's look at who of those protesters were likely um, to, uh, to take part in these protests as part of the democratic protest coalition, right? To say to, um, to surveyors that they were there to support the Democrats as opposed to one of the other um, non-democratic groups. 
Okay, so this will look very um, familiar from the cross-national analysis first. <coughs> and it looks like the middle class is a little bit more likely to take part in that democratic protest coalition than the non-middle class. But if we look at the results by sector, we see that again, <coughs> Um, it's really the private sector middle class versus everyone else. That private sector middle class is more likely to um, be part of the democratic protest coalition, whereas um, the state sector middle class is indistinguishable from the working class. And if you're wondering why these big bars, these bigger bars, and in the last, it's because, well, particularly for the state working class, right, there are just very few people like this who are participating. We have a very small sample size. So again, extrapolation is fraught with its perils, but if we were to extrapolate from, um, from these data, it would suggest that um, growth of, uh, of the, the state sector middle class wouldn't contribute to the size of the democratic protest um, coalition. All right, so I'm gonna skip through. This is some background on who chooses state employment. And let me just um, wrap up. Right, so, um, so why were those state workers there? Right. One um, argument is that those state workers were there to essentially renegotiate the kind of bargain that they had um, with the regime within the context of the existing um, political system, without wanting um, regime change, without wanting democracy. Right, that they wanted to renegotiate the terms of their agreement with the regime. And that's sort of essentially what they got. At least that's what right, the Kremlin seems to have inferred about what they were after, um, judging by the May decrees um, in which the Kremlin promised to hike um, salaries across the public sector and to hold regional authorities accountable um, over the coming period for carrying, um, carrying that out. Now, surprise, surprise, those decrees didn't always pan out the way that they were promised. Those, um, you know, those, um, those pay raises um, didn't come through for public sector employees until about a year ago, as Putin was beginning his bid for fourth term as president. December 2017, January 2018, this is commenting on it on social media, all of a sudden, you know, surprise, um, the May decree payments came not as a pre-election bribe, but just surprisingly on time. Um, so those pay hikes came through, but belatedly, suggesting that the regime was thinking strategically and knew the importance of, of um, patronizing this group within the middle class. Um, we also saw um, raises for public sector employees um, announced at the end of last year and promised um, for this year. I and mean, conversely, for that group of like, you know, entrepreneurs or freelancers, um, the self-employed, or right? you see new taxes in 2019, right? suggestive of who's in and out um, of this loyal middle-class coalition. All right, so to summarize, and I'm trying to argue that middle-class formation really differs in important ways under conditions of high state economic engagement, that it increases middle-class opposition to democratization and divides potential uh, democratic coalitions. Okay, so I think the story that I told about Russia helps um, to understand um, that uh, there's this long-standing um, and important association of comparative politics literature between development and democratization. Okay, but sometimes right, development occurs without democratization. Generally, really scholars have been puzzled by that. Right? This provides kind of concrete micro-level mechanism via um, middle-class opposition, the failure to create um, social basis of support um, for democratization. And you know, it's interesting, if you look at like cross-nationally, the association, this much vaunted association between development and democracy, right, um, actually disappears empirically in post-World War II samples. And it happens that in the post-World War II period, we also have the peak of um, state, direct state economic engagement. So plausibly, one, um, kind of micro level explanation for, um, for, the, the, for that association, for the absence of that association in the post World War II period, um, is, uh, is the explanation that, that I've offered today. Right, this also suggests that the state middle class is a really important swing group in uh, the stability of regimes such as Russia's, um, and so that we should be especially attentive to shocks to um, the state's ability to provide uh, selective benefits. Um, to the public sector. Right here, we've seen even as um, <coughs> uh, budgets 
have tightened, um, even as the Kremlin has been their economic strain, that it's continued to try to prop up um, these groups um, at the expense of, of others. So raising the pension age or um, raising taxes on freelancers, for example. I, I think this work also suggests um, that privatization that puts um, really puts state resources um, uh, out of, uh, uh, or puts resources rather out of reach of the state um, is, uh, uh, is in, uh, indeed an important mechanism um, for democratization. I mean, but privatization, I think this story reminds us, has to also create upward mobility to work. And which I think is relevant for us as scholars of this region because privatization in the early 1990s created a lot of downward mobility. Right? And if you remember the plots that you know the, the plots that I showed you twice, like the the um, state sector middle class is um, in, if the state sector middle class becomes or like a private sector working class, those groups are no more the private sector working class is no more supportive of democracy than the state sector middle class was. Right, so you're not getting more sort of bottom up pressure for democratization. Okay, so I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, that was terrific. Yeah, a lot of uh, interesting uh, findings. Um, maybe I'll just ask you a first question just to get things going, um, which is, uh, you know, kind of, you know, mostly in the presentation you talked about kind of like loyalty and um, uh, support for democracy, you know, which are kind of seen as going against each other, but in theory they might not necessarily be in opposition if the people who are supporting Putin not showing up at the protests think that they are in a democracy. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I don't know, have you had a chance to look at kind of whether or not, you know, these kind of state dependent middle class people, like do they think Russia is any more democratic than others? Um, do you suspect that that's part of the uh, you know the, the mechanism here. The, you know, just because they're getting, they're benefiting, so maybe they see it as a more democratic outcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a great, it's a great question, um, and it's certainly the case that people misinterpret like what's meant by democracy, which I think is one of the reasons why it's important to drill down and ask about these more, but more specifically about the importance of of um, specific democratic institutions, right? Like, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, democracy is preferable, believing that Russia is currently a democracy. Another thing to say that a strong political opposition, right, is really important. Um, um, I think that, that, that those are important differences. Um, in the, the protest questions, oh, we're asking a different question, which is about support for, um, you know, democratic political parties, right? <coughs> Um, which, um, which is, which is, I think is, is very clearly not like the story, you know, that um, uh, Russia is currently a democracy, um, therefore um, um, we don't need to to, um, to 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 change anything because we already have what we desire. And we're Democrats, right? They're um, they're not supporting democratic political actors and political parties within the system. That's what those results show. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, let's open things up, so please. Just uh, ask you to introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Ann Broom, and I'm a visitor. It's a very interesting talk, as I thought it would be. Um, it seems to me, however, there's uh, you are somehow still saying, however, the middle class is a major agent of change. Now, it just so happens that uh, you know democracy, the switch to democracy, was the change from the preceding authoritarian model. However, it seems where this conclusion, where you say there's still an important swing group, they still could swing for a change to the extent they become dissatisfied, although that change might, in this scenario, be to democratiza further democratization. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so yeah. I think that this, this can be an important swing group in a couple of um, that if um, if their um, their uh, uh, dependence on the state right is lessened, um, if their state employment becomes a source of grievances rather than uh, a source of benefits, and then they may swing against the regime. Okay, but we shouldn't be um, so confident that they're going to swing in favor of democracy. Right, they may swing in favor of a cycling of uh, a different no change you know, structural changes political system, but new political leadership. Um, so, so that's that's the sense in which, like, I'm skeptical about um, the basis of, of their support for democracy.
Can you remind again the, the time of timing of the survey data that you were looking at? Sure. So for the cross national piece, that's um, that's EBRD data that's from two thousand six in the middle of right. Okay. So the cross national piece is from the middle of Putin's second term. Okay. And then you know all of this. So all of this information is more about cross national. The, the conclusions you're making are from the cross national data or from Russian data from the Levada Center or some so other. The, con source. the conclusions rate are broadly based on triangulating evidence across a variety of sources, the cross-national piece and the Russia piece that gives us some greater confidence right, that these attitudes also line up with um, the actions that people take in, in the streets. So they're based on all of the, that evidence. And the, the Russian survey data are obviously from the later, from like two, between 2011 and 2013. Okay, I have a few people on my list. Uh, as Peter. Uh, uh, Peter Romer here from Irish. Um, I have a question regarding this middle class, or state supported middle class, loyal middle class, in a historical perspective. Uh, is it going too far to assume that this is derivative of the um, Soviet uh, uh, you know, Communist Party membership, these 20 million or so bureaucracy? This was the number that was usually given, like 20 million members of the bureaucracy with their families. Um, that now have transformed into this kind of uh, Putin loyalist uh, middle class and that is supporting um, uh, the regime more or less. And that's why Putin intuitively or consciously is actually uh, nourishing them and is actually uh, uh, you know, giving them gifts. But the question to me is uh, how will this class behave in a period of crisis? Because uh, when the Soviet system in the 80s was in a period of crisis, that class, while it did not uh, support you know, democracy very actively. It also didn't defend the old system very actively. And basically, it was passive. Have you any data about what the attitude of this uh, loyal middle class would be in a period of economic or socioeconomic uh, crisis? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a great question, right? And it's one that I'm concerned about, particularly when you're looking at just the, 